Well done. Leaning tower, step to ground. Quad stretch, step to ground. I'm going to share with you uh, the why behind what it is, where my thought process came from when I came here a couple of years ago, and how supportive it's been amongst the staff and amongst our whole uh, coaching staff and our philosophy in general and so forth. It's received a lot of support. So really quick, you know, 26 years of experience, and I spent a lot of this time in the state of Vermont, 14 years up north. The next you know, 12, 14 years, I've been spreading myself out around the world. And a lot of the philosophy um, in, in developing the YSC Academy was founded on many of the principles, of course, of Bird Mountain Academy. Well, what I did there when I was there has shaped how I view athletic development. And I came to Burke as an athletic trainer. So prevention of injury, sort of, mostly deal with kids who got hurt, and then deal with a lot of the illnesses and concerns. Really prevention side, yes, but not as strong, because we don't learn it that well in college. But we had a lot of injuries. And so my welcoming year there were nine anterior cruciate ligament injuries, ACL injuries, in the first year. And it all happened in about a four month period. So it was welcome to what ski racing is all about. Nine ACLs, a femur fracture, a tib-fib fracture, down lower leg fracture, and another MCL meniscal type injury. So all of a sudden you had 12 athletes who were finished for their season. So quickly you become a me expert because you have a lot of kids to work with. The following year, we had nine season ending injuries, of which seven of those were ACLs. We had a problem, I would say. So that really started pushing me towards looking at solutions rather than just saying I'm going to help fix these guys. We must look at an alternative way, an alternative strategy, because they're not developing the way they should hope to develop because many of them are getting hurt for a season and so forth. Well, the strategy we put into place then after looking at a lot of things, so the first six years was 3.5 ACLs a year for six years, and the following six years was 0.5 ACLs. And that's not a scientific study from the perspective of how many kids did you have, how many more contact days did they have, how many days of skiing might they have done, could there be subtle nuances? No, it wasn't that scientific, it was just results oriented. We had less knee injuries, we had more kids um, getting a chance to progress, right? So when I left Burke Academy, I went on to work with an orthopedic group. So what I decided was I want a chance to start working with a lot of athletes from other sports, not just ski racers. And I wanted a facility where they can come to see me, but I can also go and travel. And I hooked up with this orthopedic group at this mountain in, uh, in Vermont. So once again, there's a ski theme here, as Finn talked about. And that was where I got, you know, my, where I started from and so forth. But now all of a sudden I start hanging out with the orthopedic surgeons, the sports medicine doctors, and that just gives me more of a medical mind and a medical perspective on what we might be doing to reduce injury and also enhance performance. At Burke, it was, no, we've got to really enhance performance because it was a very um, high level um, youth development system. There were many athletes there that were elite, I would say. Um, you know, world ranked top five, you know, top ten, nationally ranked top five, top ten. And then there was a lot of other very talented athletes like at this Philadelphia Union Academy. So I took this idea from what Burke and I learned, brought it to this orthopedic group and said I need support to run programs to help these injured athletes and also start looking at the science a little bit more. And I spent ten years doing that. And that was really about this idea of blending reconditioning, which is like rehab, and athletic development. I've had opportunities to work with many teams and organizations. And I show this to you only to say it's my perspectives on how I look at athletic development, injury prevention, comes from multiple cultures, multiple sports, and many different scenarios. So athletic development, when done well, solves a lot of our problems and helps prepare these individuals for you guys to coach. We see this as these youth athletes, because we have contact with the little guys, the middle-aged little guys, and then our adolescents, right? So we have contact with these three different phases, and, and we're actually looking at it um, in the past year or so, but moving forward, we're looking at it as one system now. Now, of course, the training is slightly different, but the mindset and the application is the same. Developing athletic movements is important at the young ages, 
reinforcing those athletic movements along the continuum is very important. And quite honestly, even at the first team level, developing good athletic movements is still very important. Not that they already you know, may think they have them, but some aren't good enough at those things. So the way it used to be, it was really simple. Tumble, roll, push, pull, fall, and other examples that take place. I used it last week, and I mentioned this La Sierra High School in the 50s, and it was world famous. They were on The Tonight Show. They were on Life Magazine, I think it was. Everyone was studying what was going on at La Sierra High School in California as they were to have a master level physical education curriculum in their high school. And that's what these boys down at the bottom and, and the pegboards up in the upper right, they're not lifting heavy weights in the 50s, so to speak, right? Somewhere. But they were getting these physiques through many different ways. And quite honestly, we're starting to say, you know, this isn't happening the same way it used to happen. And does new mean better? Is new just different, meaning how we train athletes today? And perhaps maybe we should look at what was very simple before that created a pretty good physical athlete. Now, while the sport of soccer has been changing, all right, high intensity runs and things, yes, we have to keep up and adapt. But maybe a lot of our basic athletic development models could be basic and be very good. So it's important because remember I, I started at Burke Academy and it was very much experience-based evidence, right? You learn as you were there, you apply principles of your education and science. And then I worked for 10 years with this orthopedic group where we really looked at what does science really say is happening, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based prevention and things. And it's that blend is important. But I've never been held back by science. I've always looked and say because you can't prove it doesn't mean it's not working. So performance and prevention, it's one common language. If we do it well, if we develop athletes well, it should take care of our prevention strategies. Or if our prevention strategies, if you say that's what's most important, it really should address the performance level, so to speak, off the ball type work that can help these athletes grow. So is there a, event, a difference between the two? And I think there is because Prevention was a medical emphasis. Right now with the FIFA 11, as an example of a medical-based prevention model, or um, 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 the Santa Monica group has one, or PEP, PEP program, there's a few very good, well-established prevention programs that were developed by doctors, therapists, with some strength coaches, but it was medical-driven because someone needed to step in to try to reduce injury. And it wasn't happening at the level necessary just based on being involved in sport. Sports coaches were not taking prevention to the level that they needed to. They were just being coaches. And that's not universal, of course, but it has been a trend that we've seen. So medical stepped in and said, we can help. And you know what happened when they said, we can help? They just did something that shows the most basic of exercises, the most basic application of exercises in the warm-up, let's say, all right? And that reduced injury dramatically. But it has to be done very well, as they're finding out with all of these injury prevention strategies, like the FIFA 11. If it's not done well, it actually statistically isn't as good as they say. It must be done well. So prevention, performance-based, and medically supported. Because the doctors and our medical teams have to be in the center of this equation for the health and welfare of our athletes like getting cardiac screening and so forth, right? Dealing with concussions. The medical people have to be there. But they are part of a puzzle where everyone contributes. We're fortunate here. The model we've helped develop, and Richie and Tommy, all right, and everyone, has said we actually can put into place all these different pieces of the puzzle from our academy level, soon to be our USL level, and on into the first team. And that should provide a better continuum of care which can also provide a better continuum of performance. We must have performance goals, and we heard this last night. Great speech last night, thoroughly enjoyed it, and they touched on this idea of there are performance goals that we need to be looking at, like the attitude and the mindset and so forth. And the speaker had his whole list of things that were, that were looking at. It was very interesting on his whole list of these very important things was basically that, all of meeting all those criteria, to me, as I heard it, that defines talent. Talent wasn't just what you did with a ball, it's, it's ability and how we scout. It's can people meet all of those things in there? 
Well, these performance goals must be set up within your club, and they are probably, or a national team level. And you have to look at this. It's not just style of play. It's all parts of the athlete. But regardless, you can't achieve performance goals if the individual is hurt. And a team may struggle to achieve their performance goals if your starting striker, your goal scorer is hurt, or your center back, a key player gets hurt, or there's two or three athletes who get hurt. All of a sudden, achieving performance goals gets more difficult. So injury prevention is very, very important. But I choose, and we choose, to look at it this way. All right? Athletic development is our prevention strategy, performance-based mindset towards reducing injury. Simultaneously, it should reduce the likelihood of getting hurt. So I see athletic development in this way. I want to develop better soccer playing athletes because they need to understand this relationship between physical competence and skill development. I don't always want to stand in front of my coaching staff and our athletic directors and say, I can help you, and this model of athletic development will make them better soccer players. Because if we, if we look at that continuum of all those things that are, that are required to make someone a talented soccer player, all right, what, what Nuha talked about today and so forth, there's so many different parts of this to make them truly come out of this end talented. I want to be a part of that. And our program wants to be a part of that. So first of all, make them a better soccer playing athlete, more athletic. I feel we can achieve that. A couple people that have been influential in, in how I view this as well, based on my own experiences, and a collegial relationship, Fern Gambetta, very good um, overview of athletic development. It's a very basic principles. He knows the science, he understands the science, but he can present it in a way in which it brings it down to a level that I certainly enjoy. I like to talk at a high level. I like to talk at a grassroots basic level. We need to be able to do both. Kelvin Giles, he's English, but he spent a great deal of time in Australia at the Australian Institute of Sport and helped develop many youth development models and screening models, trying not only to look at will this reduce injury, but are there basic fundamental physical qualities that kids should have as they move through a continuum of, of development. And he studied that extensively. And so his writing is very, very good as well. We've broken it down to, say, five key areas that we want to address. One, building physical sustainability. So we are striving to build physical sustainability for developing athletes by understanding the relationship between competence and sports-specific skill development. To build for the future, each athlete must have this exposure to and comprehension of these essential movement patterns, as Nuha was explaining earlier today. Comprehension of, not just, and Finn was saying, not just yes, but do you understand why you're saying yes. This physical education will be necessary to develop the robustness required for sustaining this journey, this skill-specific journey. We are striving to achieve this level of comprehension through consistent exposure, but they must be well executed and well coached fundamental skills. Again, this idea of quality. Hmm. Number two, coach the athlete to physical competence. This, the synonyms here make complete sense. But the opposite of these, the antonyms, it would not be much fun to describe your athletes and your team with these words. So we basically can say is, if they don't have these physical competence, what are the things that they have? Disability, incapability, incapacity, ineptitude, ineptness, right? It's a horrible way to think about it, and we should be doing something about it. Every movement contained in a sports-specific action, whether running, jumping, throwing, kicking, catching, tumbling, demands that the athlete express some form of force reduction, stabilization force production. Typically, these movements occur along the entire kinetic chain and uh, demand a degree of multi-joint, multi-directional, and movement efficiency. And our goal here is to educate every movement, OK? Educate this athlete um, to train this athlete to this physical competence. Number three, the journey from physical to technical to tactical. And this was fun to listen to in the past two days. 
Understanding the relationship between physical education and skill development is essential if the coach of the program is to establish this progressive pathway for the athlete. And the keystone of our, of our athletic development program is to keep this athlete's physical competence developing ahead of their technical skills and hopefully developing ahead of their tactical. We want to have athletes playing at high intensity, fast, aggressive, if that is the choice of the coaching staff. But if they don't have the physical foundation to do that, they can't keep up with what you're trying to ask them to do. And that's not just within a session. It's within a week, it's within a month, it's within a, within a year, and potentially within their career. And some kids' careers cut short because they're physically not able to keep up, and they get cut. With this approach, the athlete will have had prior physical experience available to them. And this may aid skill development as the tasks become more difficult or as they're executed more intensively. Having quality technical experiences that are consistently repeatable and able to withstand the effects of speed and fatigue should be the program or should be the goal of every program to effectively train athletes. And this is why the athlete's physical preparation outside of their specific force or uh, sport must be taken seriously. But someone has to take it seriously. Whose responsibility is this at this point? Because early sports specialization and the lack of consistent quality physical education in schools is creating an environment where athletes are moved through a sports continuum with glaring limitations of their physical qualities. They're not strong enough, they're not stable enough, they're not robust enough. Many young athletes lack the ability to catch or throw an object based on this specialization, and these limitations often take place in these skill-hungry years, and this can affect them later. These repercussions from poor development and physical competence can influence potential injury or poor performance. We understand that. Unfortunately, most coaches are focused on the technical and the tactical. As we like to say sometimes, they're focused on what happens on the green, but they're not focused on anything that happens off of the green, the grass. We have the ability to influence that. So I feel every coach must take the time to implement training into one's physical competence. Every skill coach, not the fitness coach necessarily, not the technical coach, not the head coach, but all coaches should have this ability. And it doesn't take long. It can be five minutes before training, after training. It could be 5, 10, 15 minutes. The cumulative effect. So as we say, the process is cumulative and if consistently addressed, the opportunity, it can improve. Developing fundamental movement skills, it takes time. But you have to start somewhere. Not all programs are doing this. And sometimes within a program, not all age groups are doing it. Individual coaches might take it upon themselves to apply methods of athletic development or strength to improve robustness in these athletes to reduce injury, but not all athletes within the program. So therefore, it is not program-wide. That's not a continuum of care. So the process is cumulative, and we must take the time to prepare each athlete for the demands of the sport training in the future, not just this season, or not just for this age group. Be proactive, because there are no shortcuts and young athletes are not just smaller professional athletes so don't train them that way. We have four pillars of athletic development that we like to look at here. There were five key points but these pillars of athletic development is something that makes it very basic yet very also complex if you would like. Gymnastics. It's complex because we have a gymnastics floor or a gymnastics center basically but it's simple because we can do half of everything we do on the grass. Coordination, core strength, mobility, confidence, focus, control. All of these things we've been hearing last night and today are coming into play in these physical competencies, just like their intellectual competencies that they need to develop. We'll take a brief look. These are some of the physical qualities that we're pointing out here. The gymnastics, excuse me, routine for athletes. This would be a morning training session for our athletes that are in the YSC Academy, of which two-thirds of the athletes in the YSC Academy play for the Philadelphia Union Academy as well. 
So we are reaching pretty deep into all of our athletes just by this type of gymnastic experience. These things take shoulder control, arm um, core control, stabilization and stability. Remember that ability to push, press, roll, tumble, fall, jump, land. It is off the ball. And a lot of the work that, that you will hear me um, um, show here in these four pillars, one common theme is, but is this soccer specific? And ideally, you can say it is not soccer specific, but it is soccer relevant. And developing a more robust athlete is soccer relevant. The specificity oftentimes will take place, of course, on the pitch. These card wheels are, are our form of core strength and core development, OK? Here's another look. This would be our U14s with a few goalkeepers thrown in, OK, that are older. But these are our U14s. This would probably be a training center that is done as a warm up prior to them going out on the pitch. Or they may have already had a pitch training session, and they're coming in for 20 minutes of gymnastics. But we get to that place where they're doing one hand cartwheels. They're not gymnasts, and these kids didn't know they could do that because no one had ever asked them to do that. So with good coaching, with one of our staff members who is a former gymnast and a diver, she teaches these things for us. You say you did that before practice? Sure. Now, it could be before as one of our warm-up strategies, yes, mm -hmm. or it could be done after a pitch training session to make sure that we can get, remember, 60% of our athletes are in the school. Yeah. And they can come in in the morning, which means the rest of the majority, they don't come in in the morning. So we're trying to fulfill our obligation to these pillars of athletic development, which means we, we borrow these athletes off the pitch to do some of this work. And the coaches are a part of that process and very supportive. Multi-dimensional speed and agility, our second um, pillar. Running, sprinting technique, deceleration, change of direction. See. There are many athletes who are already very fast. They're your fastest runners on your team. And oftentimes, I come across in my travels, we don't need to teach that person to be fast. They're already fast. But it's kind of like saying, well, then why teach them any more of the skills to be a better soccer player? They're already talented. Because they need to become better, of course. We can make a fast person faster. And if you can't, a lot of track coaches are out of business, right? Everyone can become faster. And it might not be that they have to run all the time and look like a sprinter. They need to cover the first three steps potentially faster. They need to be able to cover the first five to 10 meters faster, get to a place quicker. All right? That isn't just about reaction time. It's also about force production and technical skills, like arm action, proper execution of running. So we feel that sprint technique and the drills to support developing sprinting technique promotes strong physical sustainability. Because to run fast, you have to have strong hamstrings. You have to have good posture. One of the things we looked at from a two years ago, Garrison, our sports scientist, we looked at some of our preseason testing, middle season, end season, one of our screens, yes? So we had a repeat 40 meter sprint test. One of the highest correlations to any other physical quality was push-up strength, because we tested our athletes in push-ups. That's no surprise for a track coach at all, because it takes tremendous core strength in order to transmit force into the ground repeatedly. You lose force when the upper body is a little bit weaker and a little bit soft. So track coaches have no surprise that that correlation existed. So, Deceleration, change of direction, acceleration. Remember, most injuries happen in deceleration. Slowing down, changing direction. And not all kids are good at it. They start to slow down and they break over at the waist. Their tactic is weak. They drop their chest. Dropping your chest is just bad positioning. Your head is down, typically. It's not quick to react to the next play. Our coaching is always about the next play position. Whatever position you're in, are you ready for the next play. And if you're bent over, if you're wide stepped, if you're not in balance, you're not ready for the next play. Here's what that looks like a little bit. We promote a lot of range of motion, mobility in the athlete, angles especially. Angle, knee, and hip must always be extremely mobile through their journey from 
10-year-olds all the way up to 18, all the way to the first team. Because athletes lose ankle mobility regularly. And that leads to pathologies, typically. Achilles tendon, patella tendon, hamstring injuries, hip injuries. So this is mobility training. Hurdle drills on a regular basis, over and under, maintaining hips. So the warm-ups incorporate this at some level every single day. Every day there's a form of mobility, strength, all right, taking place, speed and acceleration, and oftentimes some form of a gymnastic movement is taking place in the warm-up. But then, a few times a week or two times a week, we are spending 30 minutes doing acceleration, deceleration, change of direction training, and then we would flip those athletes and spend 30 minutes doing gymnastics or strength or one of our other two pillars. Landing as done by the medical community is a very pristine, smooth thing. Jump off a box, land with your knees and toes in a perfect position, but it's not taking place that way on the pitch. Athletes fall, and we're trying to teach them get up in a hurry. So all the roles and things that they do is really to prepare them that when you get tripped and you go down, you have a chance, if you so desire, to get up quickly. You may actually keep a play moving on. You may continue to be involved in a play and move on. We also can see a decrease potentially in fractures of the wrist, of the elbow, of the forearm, or dislocations of the shoulder or AC joints, right? Because if you know how to fall properly, you can protect yourself a little bit better. And we have a very low incidence of these types of injuries. Here would be another look. In a warm-up, for example, where we do some multi-dimensional speed and agility and so forth, we have to prepare for that cutting. So the bracing isn't bracing on your elbows or bracing on your hands. We did all the side planking movements, and all our athletes could go for 90 seconds or two minutes, whatever they needed to. It was a very quick test. It didn't really tell us anything other than they had the ability to suffer and shake a little bit. But it really didn't show that much. So this all here, this is just like the company you know, retreat with the trust games, isn't it? Because we have some athletes who cannot hold the plank like that boy can. And the reason is because they don't trust the kid holding them. Because when I walk over and I say, no, 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 you must stay stiff. Stay stiff. And then I brought, drop him down. He stays stiff. When I say it right next to him and his teammate is holding him, he bends at the waist and he collapses. That's a trust issue. So we will constantly change who they're working with. The old tip-ups, right? And then you can make it silly. This is, this is as much team building as it is anything else right there, those fun little games, right? But it, there's some strength and control. These partner pushes. The reality is, is they don't want to push this individual too hard until we really get into this physicality of Go ahead and shove them, because the reality is you do get shoved. And we teach stiffness of the foot and the ankle hitting the ground, because that stiffness of the foot and ankle hitting the ground is what's required to produce force. It's also what's required to reduce force. And it's our, our, our uh, strategy to try to reduce ankle injuries. But as much as it's trying to reduce ankle injuries, it's trying to teach them to produce and reduce force for performance. Run faster, stop faster. The third pillar, strength, critical component. But really, what does strength ultimately mean? It's not about how much weight you can lift. It's how much straight strength you can use that matters for us. So resistance training and body weights and total body emphasis and all of these other things that take place with strength. But the way it used to be, old school pictures that I showed you, we're trying to not just replicate that the exact way they did it, but use a lot of principles of training that have evolved, but also realize don't get too far away from the basics. If we can get the basics done extremely well with very good coaching, consistent coaching, we feel we can make a big impact in the overall athletic development. Science is there and a lot of machines are available to us, but it's not that I'm rejecting it because I don't believe they can work. I'm first saying get the basics right and see how far this can take us. And then as we move through this model and understand the effectiveness of it, add to it, add more. But I'm convinced it might not be about adding more machines. It's just going to still be about 
a very creative approach and a well-coached approach towards getting strong, getting quote unquote fit, whatever fit ultimately means. Four, competitive coordination games. So last night I heard this, heard it with Finn this morning in Nuha, get the athletes involved and have active participation. This is PE. This is physical education class. So we have on staff a certified physical education teacher, Anthony. Right? He runs a lot of our kids' classes and was working very close in us developing these play games. These games that have strategies about team building, winning the game, um, athlete puzzles, skill development, faster decision-making type skills. Nuha, earlier, so the, three, the four C's, critical thinker, communicator, collabor collaborator, um, creator, all right? The four C's of, of, of thinking in the classroom. Well, CCG, competitive, it's, I've got two of the C's ultimately, right? Teaching methods such as direct instruction, limited instruction, peer-based learning, visual instruction. Coordination skill training like closed space, open space, spatial awareness, object influence, partner influence. This is all physical education, language, methodology. And we're using that in creating seven, eight, nine different games or 10 different games. And then all the little changes within each of these games where kids learn how to push their boundaries, become leaders, who's the leader, basically how to cheat within the rules, how to listen to instructions and realize, you know, they never said, they said we can't run with the ball, but they never said we can't dribble with the ball. And we're just looking for that kid that takes off and just starts dribbling with the ball. And then you got 15 kids screaming saying he can't do that. And they all stare at Anthony. And Anthony is just like, I didn't say you couldn't. Boom, and the kid scores. Now it's game on again with new drill, new skills. And then you're looking for the next kid to distort the thought process. Pardon me. Here's a couple clips. Like I've always said, dodgeball just never gets old. It's a great game. You actually learn a lot about different kids. Who's hiding in the back? Who's your alpha male? Kickball, because in America we have baseball. And we've got some kids that they don't, they've never played baseball before, whether from other cultures or even from America. They haven't even played baseball. So it's kind of those rules. This little game, you have to hit the ball against the trampoline. Juke ball, a juke ball, it's called, right? Ball's got to hit the floor. That's four on four in a small space. Now, lacrosse. It's a cone, it's a ball, and then you change the rules by the only way you can score is the guy who's got the little racket, and he can't grab it with his hands. So next thing you know, we have a boy who has that racket with the ball and goes a full 40 yards or 35 yards in the indoor pitch. And he goes tap, tap, and someone comes over. He taps it over his head, runs around him, tap, tap, and other kids. Boom, he taps it to this, switches hands. Tap, tap, goes down, scores. It's like, I, I was just said, I had the camera. I couldn't even press record because I was just in awe of watching it. And then you ask him, did you, did you play tennis? No, I didn't play tennis. What, what games? Baseball? No, no baseball. Played some volleyball. So he just understood maybe hands above head, hitting, hand-eye coordination. He understood that. And he just said, well, using a racket's pretty easy. And off he went. And he just played the spaces around the people. He ran into space every single time. He actually passed to himself, went into space, picked it back up. So unless we create these other games, we don't know. Now, I do know is that multi-sport athletes is something America is very much into, and that's kind of our culture. And I think there's something there that many sports can teach many of these skills. Many sports can teach an athlete to look at the, game, the same game differently. So that's something to consider. And while we are specialized, and I think, I don't know what I feel completely on specialization, but boy, I'd really like to see kids playing a couple sports at least, up through ages 12 to maybe 14, depending, right? I'd really like to see that. But all of a sudden, I'm involved in specialization. I was involved in specialization at Burke Mountain Academy because they were 14-year-olds to 18-year-olds. But we decided to do something about that specialization by trying to broaden this competency um, um, opportunity, expand their level of physical development by giving them a chance to develop their physical competencies. OK, we'll finish up five minutes. Major League Soccer Academy, let's look at how is this working? 
How are we valuing that says this form of athletic development is helping us? All right. If we have two programs here, we have a program of the Philadelphia Union okay, and then also the school. So if you see the union label and the school label, that means they are involved in the school across the street and our, our, our full-time full union program, which just means training twice a day. They train in the morning, they train in the afternoons. Whereas another, say, 40% of our athletes, they only train in the afternoons. We can look at their hours of contact for soccer. So because they train in the mornings, we don't play soccer five days a week in the mornings. All right? That actually was an original idea to say we can increase soccer contact time. But I saw it as we can increase the total volume and load significantly on them. And are they robust enough and strong enough to handle that increased load? Because we may see an uptick of injuries. So it was let's take the time not away from soccer development in total, but borrow from that double training session day and instill athletic development. And you can see at the bottom, 125 hours. Now this is data from two years ago, but it was very similar to last year, Garrison? Very similar, yeah. So 125 hours of athletic development, if they were full-time, so to speak, right, involved, that's significantly different than if they weren't. And what this came down to was 33% of our time was spent off the ball. It was spent with athletic development. Right? Now remember, off the ball can be looked upon as 33% of the time not playing soccer, that's crazy. But don't forget, we added soccer contact time. We added more field contact time than normal, typically. Okay? Some data that came out if we look at the bottom from England, Spain, Holland, was looking at hours a week that people are training. So in England, roughly for our age population, 16 hours a week. Um, in Spain, 12 to 16-year-olds, uh, okay, was less, six hours a week. But they're used 17 to 18, 16 hours a week. The Dutch, same thing, about 16 hours a week. So we're actually looking at it, uh, 15 hours, 15 and a half hours a week if they were involved in our soccer, in our full program. But remember, the kids that weren't involved in the morning, they're getting 10 hours a week. So they're actually under what is of average with some other academies. And this is data that Garrison got from some published uh, um, reports on academies in Europe. Injuries, if we look first on the bottom, 4.9 or arguably 4.9 to 7 injuries per 1,000 training hours from many of those academies. Whereas at the Union for us, 1.85 injuries per 1,000 training hours. And as low as 375, which is way too high for us, but still under for the kids that are not participating in our full athletic development program two times a week. So we are increasing contact time. We are increasing more, I'm sorry, more soccer hours, if we're involved in both, and more total contact time through athletic development. Now that athletic development contact time that's not just lifting weights. That's gymnastics, competitive coordination games, right? CCG, or um, multi-dimensional speed and agility, which demands cutting, change of direction, contact, running, diving, which means we're putting them at risk. So we are increasing soccer contact time, increasing total contact time, which is ultimately increased risk on their bodies, yet their injury rates are significantly lower. That's good. In 2014, 2015, last year, it was 1.1 injuries per 1,000 training hours. And I mentioned player availability here because that doesn't just mean to us, are they available for selection on game day? Are they available for practice every day? Right? That says trainability. We are improving an athlete's trainability because they have the opportunity to be on the pitch regularly in order to receive your instruction and your coaching. We're giving them this opportunity to advance because they're at least available and they are showing that they are robust enough to handle this day to day, week to week, month to month, within a year. So at the end of the, the a very long year for us, so our U18s last year who lost in the national tournament in the group stages, but that was in June and that was 10 months into our season, Every player was available for selection, except one who was coming off of mononucleosis. He actually was back to team training, but he just wasn't fit, so he didn't travel. Our U16s, 
who got third place in the national tournament and went until the middle of July, 11 months after preseason started. Every player was available for selection. They were all fit and available. And that is a roster of 32, Garrison? Total athletes on the roster. Obviously not 32 traveled and 32 were not picked for that final tournament, but they were all healthy and available. And our U14s were all available. Not a national tournament, of course, regional, eastern. All of them, when they finished their season, the U14s were all available for selection. That's a good thing. There is plenty of luck involved in these situations. We have not had a lower extremity fracture. Part of that is luck, for sure. It could just be then a little more the physicality or the timing. Their timing is very good. That they're getting there early, they're not coming in late. Perhaps their quickness, their sense, something is aware, they're lifting their feet. I don't know, because I can't prove that scientifically. From this perspective, I'm sharing with you, or from this talk, I'm sharing you what we are doing for athletic development. And we do not know it is the best model, but I will tell you, I think it's the best model, because I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't. 